I'm Kurt Kelly. Um, I've actually been in this space for a little over 20 years, and I'm going to fight Maria for the spot of Ed's biggest fan. So, um, because of Ed, uh, you know, first of all, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to come and present today. And, uh, you know, if it wasn't for Ed, I wouldn't be involved in a lot of things. And so I guess it ultimately comes back to thank you, Maria, for getting Ed involved. So, um, but anyway, I'm here today uh, representing Credit Cure uh, along with Robbie. And uh, so Robbie is the, the founder of Credit Cure, and I'll let him kind of give a, a brief overview of himself. And uh, so we're here to talk about data centric cybersecurity. So, how it involves data, involved in IoT, and our favorite word of all right now at the moment cybersecurity. Um, yeah, I'm, first thing is I'm old because I've been uh, working on the so-called uh, control systems for the past 30 years. And uh, I've done a lot of work for Super Collider, where we built the so-called control systems and what is being called IoT today. Building all sorts of data points and data acquisition and then uh, you know, doing analytics on that. So it slowly migrated to the telecom world and today I see that to be you know, prevalent everywhere with IoT devices proliferating in billions. And I am really coming from a point of data-centric security, I'll, I'll tell you in the presentation what exactly I mean by the data-centric security. And uh, we'll, we'll show you how the integration of the new generation blockchains give you a very nice integrity angle to this. That's what we're going to uh, show today. And I have products already developed, coming today, and which I tested with uh, you know millions of sensors. It will show you how our angle really, really fits into the scenario that is really expanding in the world today. Thank you. So my part's going to be short and sweet because you're really going to want to hear what Robbie has to say. Um, so just from a market overview and kind of the market that we're in the, in the, the, the midst of tackling at the moment, obviously there's a lot of different broad numbers out there that you're going to find just depending on what you look at. But ultimately what we're trying to solve for is how to get rid of ransomware and DDoS attacks. And, and it's very creative what Robbie has come up with on the platform side in order to be able to accomplish that. So just from a very, very high level, you know, what we're looking at right now, and I really don't like the number that represents the $11.7 million right here because that's the average. Ultimately, it's right around the $80 million mark, but unfortunately there's some down in the $1 million mark that kind of skews that number. But the overall point of this is it's extremely expensive right now what we're going through in corporate America and even as individual people. I don't know if anybody in here has ever been attacked with ransomware, but I do know of people that have been. Was at a meeting actually last Friday where the comment was made, yeah, it cost me $25,000 to get my laptop back. And the next comment blew my mind because it was, but at least they were ethical enough to unlock my laptop after I gave them the $25,000. That didn't compute in my mind as to why it's okay to pay $25,000 to unlock your laptop. That, that just didn't compute, and I don't agree with it. So this is really where my passion is at because it's happening daily, and a lot of it doesn't make the typical news that you're looking at. So just know it's very prevalent. But a lot of times it hits that lower number mark, which skews this $11.7 million on the annualized piece of it. But overall, it's still an increase of 22.7% year over year. So this is not stopping. And these numbers actually are as of Q2 of 2017. So we don't even know what's happened since Q2, which it's gone up even further since then, as we all know, because of the further attacks that we've heard of since Q2. And so the average number of attacks as of this reporting was 130. Obviously, that number has increased since then as well. But even then, it's still an increase of 27% of attacks year over year. Question? The annualized cost, is the cost of the, the cost of the incidents, the cost of the... The cost of the, the incidents. Okay. Correct. Exactly. So response to the incidents. That's correct. So some of these numbers are very hard to find simply because it's happening at a rapid pace. So a lot of this typically is one or two quarters behind. So. The three that we all know of that are most common on the ransomware side of things, you've got WannaCry and Petya, and then obviously the biggest data breach that we've heard of in the news recently has been Equifax. There's others as well. So what does it look like from the, from the graph on the million side? 2014, 3.2 million. 
2015, 3.8 million. That's a massive jump from one year to the next to 638 million attacks of ransomware globally. Now, what I find very interesting is the DDoS attack sources, Egypt ranks 32%. Now, obviously, there's VPNs that can make traffic originate from wherever they want it to originate from and things of that nature. But I found it interesting because most people, whenever you talk about, well, who is it that's attacking, you know, from a DDoS perspective, I have never in casual conversation, and if somebody here has, please correct me, but I have never heard the country Egypt be mentioned, ever. They must have cheap VPNs that everybody else has. <laughs> exactly. But, it, but, you know, it, it, it was just very interesting to me where the originations of these are coming from. And so on the... The detection side, this is obviously just web applications, just in general overall, as of, this is just in Q2 of 2017, on the web app piece, 218 million attacks, just on web applications alone. Then we look at what happens in the UK, 32 million, it goes on and on and on. But it was very interesting to me, the number of attacks that are coming against the United States from a web app perspective, and a DDoS attack perspective, and a ransomware attack perspective. That was that stood out to me heavily, because I think that overall, one of the things that we're failing to do is put enough cost in our budget to be able to, to, to help out the cybersecurity side of things. And so, what is the number one thing that, when all the CIOs around globally, there was, I want to say it was a little over 2,000 of these that were, that were interviewed for this particular for this particular survey. And the difference between 2016 and 2017, as you can see, they didn't change too much as far as what their major concerns are. But the one that I want to point out that I find very interesting is the number three, this insider threat. And that's one of the things that Ravi's going to touch on today, is how we can help her is it prevent insider attacks from happening on the corporations. Because just because you have perimeter security doesn't mean that you have inside security. And if I can, if I can borrow one, one thing from Robbie that absolutely blew my mind the first time we ever met, we were having this conversation about cybersecurity, and, and he said, the thing that people are failing to think about is what's happening on the inside. We went, okay, well, and we were actually in a, a cybersecurity setting that we were listening to some different teachings go on. And he said, this blew my mind. I can send you an email with a PDF and the minute you open the PDF, I can now establish a VPN to your computer, which nullifies all your perimeter security, 100%. That's what got my attention. That's what really got my attention. Because I remember back in the day, don't open or download an executable, don't open or download a zip file, all these different things that we've heard along the years. But I was very ignorant to the fact that you could actually establish a VPN through opening a PDF file. So think about that the next time that you look at the number of white papers that you download from the internet, from all these different companies around the world, and they're all PDF format. Just a thought. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Robbie and let him tell you more about us as predicators. Yeah, the most PDFs I get are from security companies. <laughs> <laughs> so they really know how to, how to encode the VPN. Exactly. They're building their own demand. Yeah, uh, let's talk about the word predicure. Uh, I'm lucky enough that I can really do the prediction, the detection, and cure. Because I've done a lot of honey pots for, uh, you know, really, you know, when you're getting an attack, really bottle it up in a sandbox, take care of it. As well as I've done a lot of threat detection, which is being done by, I would say, at least 5,000 companies today. The threat detection is being done by lots of companies. When you talk about any cyber security company today, Primarily, they are involved in two things. The first one is the threat detection, and then the second one is the perimeter security, or uh, the authentications and things like that. So they all talk about uh, a wall with authentication and, thing, and things like that, and they're going to put lots of uh, things like PKI, all kinds of stuff, but once you really cross that, it's nothing today. People are not really looking at the data. When you talk about all these celebrated breaches, it's one thing that is getting breached, your data. When you talk about Equifax or when you talk about uh, 
the ransomware attacks, it's all about your data getting bottled up. So people are not really looking at uh, you know the, the next layer, where they peel the onion, and that's where the whole thing is getting completely defeated. Period. I mean, just like uh, you know, Kurt told, uh, told about somebody really going beyond your perimeter wall, and the whole thing is, lay, lay, I mean, is being laid completely bare. So that's what I really try to look at. When I look at it from a data perspective, everything is data for me. Your all your IoT endpoints, they're just data endpoints for me. The way I really cuddle them and the way I really protect them is how your data is going to become really secure. So when I talk about the data, I really you know come from the perspective of cryptology. You know, cryptology really talks about uh, five pillars. But before I really do that, let me first advertise what I have today. I have a complete ecosystem, a platform that can really give you all the five pillars of cryptology. I'll, I'll just show you what those pillars are. And I back it up with a hardware processor. I, I'm really working uh, with this hardware processor, which is a Wizbang one. Uh, I'm about to really completely finish off uh, the acquisition. I've done lots of uh, you know work with that now. And it is a hardware security module that can really do everything that the software can do, but just 100 times faster. It, it has got all sorts of uh, you know automatic keys, and your data really coming out of hardware completely encrypted, the whole enchilada, but it can really do it 100 times faster. So what I have is, uh, I don't want to really compare with what Apple has got or something like that, a complete software plus hardware ecosystem to really give you a holistic a holistic perspective of uh, data center data center security and uh, with the hardware module what i'm also really doing uh, today is uh, providing the entire cryptology as a service if you don't want to really you know buy the software and uh, if you just don't want to buy the chip and the pci card that comes with that you can just get it as a saas application and you can still do all your cryptology with all the new generation bitcoin and other applications that, that, that's what I have, and uh, let me peel the onion and show you how things go from here. So th these are the celebrated five pillars of cryptology. People really, you know, do one or the other, like, like when you talk about the perimeter security, you stop at authentication, and you feel that uh, I have enclaves, and I'm, I'm safe. Like I visited a couple of nuclear facilities in Texas. They all have, uh, you know, very nice perimeter security. And what they told me was they were never breached, so they are secure. Great. So, Not yeah. that they know of. Yeah. Right. <laughs> they said the enclaves have been there for the last five years, and they were never breached. Yes, not yet. But these are the real five pillars. You can really implement them. Yes, I mean, I, mean, I cannot guarantee any kind of 100% security, but you are covered in practically every direction. Okay, so this this is where I come from, and uh, when you really talk about the fourth uh, bubble, the integrity, that's the most important thing that is really making the new generation blockchains really, really popular. It's all about integrity. When you talk about the blockchains, it's all about the trust and integrity of the money that you're putting there. So if that can be guaranteed, yes, you're all interested in buying Bitcoins and hopefully they're not going to be stolen. Yes, the next generation ones are really making it messy. The Ethereums of the world are making it messy with the smart contracts and things like that. I'll also talk about that a little bit. But integrity, you know, integrity of your data, whether it is an IoT device or your money, that's the most important thing for you to really trust anything with your money. So that's where the blockchain, the Bitcoins, all these things come in. So I've integrated uh, this blockchains and everything to really satisfy that fourth pillar, the integrity pillar. So yes, I mean, you're talking about uh, how do you really do the secure key distribution. People don't trust, uh, you know, with the sharing of keys. So people want to you know, do it directly from hardware. You know, all sorts of things do happen. But I do it in software as well as hardware. Yes, you are going to be little constrained when you do it in hardware. But that's where, I mean, I have all sorts of graph databases and things like that. That's really handle the fifth pillar, which is a secure key distributor. And authentication, yes, people have all sorts of money invested in authentications, perimeter securities, and things like that. 
but I don't trust them. I have my own layer of authentication, which I do with uh, you know, multi keys and everything. I'll kind of show you how that is done. So again, uh, I mean, the, the stuff that I keep talking about, there are predominantly you know, three layers of uh, security. So everybody, talk, I mean, of course, there is a fourth layer, which is threat detection, uh, that's malware and other stuff. But predominantly, the boundary talks about firewalls, your VPNs, and everything. And then the transport is the one which does your SSLs, TLS, all that stuff. People do it, but you know, the messaging is also very, very important. And people do it, uh, I mean, to a large extent, but what they really don't do is the third layer, which is the green layer, the data-centric selective encryption, the selective protection of your data. So that's where I play. Yeah, uh, in addition to all these things, when you really talk about the blockchains and how your data has evolved, something called provenance, which is the historical evolution of your data, is extremely important. If you really want to get any trust that this data hasn't been uh, really meddled with or corrupted on the way when it flows from 1 to Z, you know, you're basically really looking at the provenance really giving you a 100% guarantee that your data hasn't been into a man in the middle attack or a buffer overflow attacks and things like that. And provenance is one thing that will really make the data applications really worthwhile. Without that, I mean, I can really talk, uh, I mean, I have an NDA with a lot of people that I'm working with. Without provenance, their applications would not exist. That's where the trust of whatever they are really selling as data as a service is just going to fail without provenance. So provenance becomes, yeah, go ahead. So just trying to clarify the provenance, right? So say, for example, there's a pressure sensor or something like that. When you say provenance, every time the packet is going from one point A to point B, it is signed. So that is, is that some kind of what you're saying, basically? So that by the time it comes to the server, there's a signature coming from the device, there's a signature coming from the gateway, and then there's a signature. Is, is that what you're talking about? No, 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 that, that is just non-repudiation, or uh, you're just signing it. But uh, beyond that, let us say if there is a man in the middle attack, somebody. See, the, have you heard about Stuxnet? Stuxnet is all about uh, man in the middle attack. So they are really intercepting the data that is coming out of the sensor and putting the wrong data and sending it to the client. <coughs> so that's where historically you have failed. Historically your, your data has failed. So that's what is provenance. I mean it's really guaranteeing you that the evolution of the data from one state to the next state yeah. is perfectly guaranteed. Yeah. That's what provenance really gives you. So root, root, root certificate servers would be have to be in that category. Well, certificate is just telling you who you are, but it's oh, still. But there has to be a. I mean, there's a there's a hierarchy, provenance back to something that you trust. Yeah, that, that that is just you know just an identity. You know, it's basically telling you that identity is uh, guaranteed by the certificate. But still, you can always go in there with some kind of okay. Let's take an insider, an insider you know, who is not supposed to really handle it, handles it and changes it. Change How do you guarantee that? That's what it is. I mean, an insider with all certificates, Edward Snowden had all sorts of certificates and, uh, you know, whatever it is, the keys that was given to him as a government contractor. So he went ahead and changed it happily and there's nothing one can do about it. So that's where the, the, the provenance and the multi-signatures and other things, they come into picture when the data piece is owned by you as the CEO and your government contractor and now the CEO has to somehow or whoever it is his boss should guarantee that this data doesn't go to somebody else just because Edward Snowden came in at 12 o'clock in the midnight and then did it. Now you're saying you should trust the CEO? Pardon? Now you're saying you should trust the CEO? <laughs> well yeah, probably you know he's the guy who should trust our... So what he's saying is that all the government data needs to be signed by President Trump. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Yeah. All right. <laughs> or, or God. Probably means God, right? <laughs> so, 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 this is, this is what I do. I work with, uh, you know, yeah. and then beyond this, you know, you, you want to have the policy, just like you said, you want now that to be signed by CEO. So maybe, maybe not. I mean, there is somebody else in the chain who might be interested in the responsibility. That's where a policy server can really give me all sorts of complex policies to make sure that Edward Snowden is not going to do the same move again. But to that point, from a trust perspective, 
Edward Snowden had the highest level of TS, okay? Yeah. In government, in government agency, you know, okay. nomenclature, right? Uh -huh. So you understand how the government security system works. Correct. Criteria. Okay. Uh -huh. right? So he was the highest level of top secret that there was. Okay. So, you know. But still, the, the guys were dumb enough to put the whole thing in his hands. Basically, there should be some other guy. It's just, just like a lockbox. There's a lockbox that you're going to open. You have your key. But at some point, you have to put it in somebody's hands. No, you can't put everything in one but, guy's hands. Like the internet. There are five people in the world that have the keys to the internet. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, one of those five people get breached, then, you know, the core routers that drive the entire internet. Why, why can't you just why can't you just ask two guys to be responsible for that instead of one guy being responsible? Okay, so there's two guys. Okay, make it three guys. There's five. Okay, all the five are not going to be bad guys. Well, one of them are bad guys. All the five, yeah. I mean, that's that's what it is. One, I mean, you cannot really trust the whole thing to Trump. Say that okay, Trump is going to do the nuclear courts. There's going to be somebody else who is going to do that. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> Trump, Trump, yeah. Trump and Putin. I guess so, so yeah. like the central point over here, I'm, I'm trying to sure. paraphrase here, is that you know when we're working at the Federal Reserve, right? Yeah. They always have, you know, these three people have to collude together to make something bad. That's right. That and idea you, is, is basically what common sense actually goes. With the internet, you have yeah. to have all five of them ultimately. Right. It, which is, yeah. you know, it reduces the probability. Right. So right? It sounds like providence can never be 100 percent. Nothing is 100%. No, no, you're not talking about providence here. You're talking about, uh, you know, trust. might be 99.999. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But basically, having, you know, multiple guys or multi <laughs> I mean, uh, multiple signatures <laughs> needing to do something, say, bad. If uh, Trump is going to have a singular authority to do the nuclear codes, then we're doomed. You better have somebody else really saying that, oh, no, I'm not going to do it. Or yeah, two more guys saying that I'm not going to do it. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, the risk is substantially reduced when you do that. To, to Kurt's earlier point about the, the rise in insider threats, I think what we're seeing here is, is a realization that it's, it's not just disgruntled employees. It's occasionally you know, somebody close to retirement or know that they're leaving the company for another job. And, and I think the solution is all about uh, compartmentalization, segmentation of your network, and and a review of what information that those individuals can actually access to ensure that, that they don't have carte blanche to access and, and take off with all of your valuable IP. Exactly. See, I'll show you in, in the application that I'm going to demo. This is what I do. When I get the data of uh, students coming out of several universities, right when, when it really you know, gets into my world, I really encrypt it with multiple signatures. So the university as well as the student owns it at that point. So the university cannot just release it into the internet and saying that and these are the dates of the student. So essentially whatever data point that we are looking at, it's not going to be a singular authority that can really take an unilat unilateral action and really do the so-called bad thing. So th that's how the data when it is born, you've got to really design it properly to make sure that there are enough checks and balances. So yeah, this, this, this is uh, this is kind of my brief architecture. Of course, I can talk about it for hours together. I mean, I don't think this is the forum to talk about it. Right? Uh, yeah. So so th th this is how I, I play with when I talk about all the you know five pillars of technology, uh, the integrity and multi-signature stuff. I do it with blockchains and Ethereum data structures and Ethereum uh, chains and. Uh, you know, uh, distributed webs like IPFS, Tahoe, uh, you know, file systems and things like that. that what I get with that is uh, enough ransomware and DDoS protection. Uh, I, ca I can explain it to you in technical terms, but in case you guys are really interested in that later. But what I do with PKI and multi-signatures is what is going to prevent so many robberies that are happening in the Ethereum world today. Uh, yeah, I, I can talk about uh, some of those celebrated keys that have happened in the last two, three months. Uh, so the way I do it with multi-signatures and PKI, I think I have uh, all those things pretty well covered. <coughs> and then the authentication stuff, beyond the, the, the regular uh, uh, you know, authentication uh, protocols that people use today, 
I use a fully homomorphic encryption. This is a very complicated term where you just leave your data completely encrypted and you do all your operations while it is encrypted. So I really do all my authentication stuff, which I call my own layer out there, in an FHA fashion. Okay, on the top of that, uh, you know, I, I do also some multi-key encryptions. Okay, I've got one. Well, yeah, so that, that's, that's my authentication layer out there. And then the fifth pillar that we really showed in the cryptology, the security distribution, is what I do with uh, graph databases and a complex graph of uh, certificates and keys that can be shared is what I do for secure key distributions. <coughs> and then I back it up with a policy server. In addition to all those multi-signatures, it is a policy that is telling anybody above a technical manager level, you know, will only be able to authenticate an operation. So I do it at the data level as well as at the operation level, a very complex policy server, which you can write uh, in all sorts of graph database languages today, like GraphSon and uh, GraphML and things like that. And then, of course, I also spice it up with custom ontologies. You know, I mean, this is all about semantic web and ontologies, which give you a richer set of uh, expressions that you can do to express your policies. And then the final thing is my favorite, the provenance of the data of everything that is involved here. I mean, you're, 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 you have kind of three entities out there, your data, as well as the actors that are really doing the operations and the activities of the operations that are being done in the system. These are the three primary players that, are, they are, I mean, that you have in a particular system. And you want to know the provenance of this. When you do the forensic analysis, if you really want to walk back and see who has done what to mess it up or who has done, to do, I mean, who has done something to do a very good job, you can really go through that provenance with the very simple queries and find out who has done it, what has been done, how has it been done. All sorts of uh, you know semantic queries uh, uh, can be really thrown at this provenance server and do it. This, this, this is how I do my system. Well, this is again you know this is just showing uh, the way I do uh, you know IIoT. Uh, I, I do two uh, frameworks today. OPC UA is an industry 4.0 framework, uh, which is very well done from ground up. And uh, I have a complete integration uh, into the OPC UA today. Uh, of course, uh, it, I mean, it really works with all sorts of encryptions, keys, and all this stuff, multi keys and uh, multi signatures and all that stuff. This is kind of an architecture that I do for uh, a typical data in transit or an IoT application. Yeah. A very quick question on the uh, <coughs> so the first time you put the key on your either on your crypto chip or the hardware itself. Mm -hmm. Who provides the secure, you know, private key and the public key, and, and how does that get onto the hardware? Like, at what step in the production process and deployment process does the do the key get burnt into that? Well, when 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 the, when the chip is being put, you can really burn it into that, and those are the keys that remain forever. You cannot really change them. That I don't know what what angle you're coming from. No, no, you're right. But where exactly does that happen? Does it happen in the factory production floor? Does it happen while you're deploying it, or what exactly? I mean, I'm de when I'm deploying it, I, I burn it into that. Yeah. Well, <coughs> of course, that, that is a little bit uh, you know down the layers. This, this is a very high level layer we are talking about. Even if you, you know look at it, basically. Today, OPC uh, servers are being uh, you know, wrapped around with the PLCs and each and every data point that is being done in an IoT stack. That's what this thing talks about. Yeah. Yeah. Just just to show how this uh, you know data provenance is so important out here. You know, this is a typical example where you are uh, really going through your uh, you know medical history as it flows from uh, you know one physician to another physician or one process to another process. A physician, I mean, this, this, is, this is the first question I was asked. Uh, I really visited India, and I was uh, visiting an ophthalmologist. And the first thing he asked was, is there any way I can know what my patient has gone through so far? The medications that he has taken, is he really revealing me all the details for me to really make a very good diagnostic judgment? This, is, this, this was the first question I asked when I visited this uh, doctor, who was my doctor for the last 35 years. The first question I was, I really you know, don't get all the historic details from a patient when he comes and talks to me. Even if I spend half an hour, there is no way 
I can know what this guy has gone through and what this guy is revealing to me. So this is this is an example of data provenance. Like for example, in the medical field, it, I mean, it can really uh, percolate to any other field out here. But this is a very good example. You go and then get the things done, and the doctor should be able to query how exactly this report that is in front of me today came into existence. What are all the things that have been input into this in terms of medications, in terms of you know whatever it is that has been prescribed by some other doctor? How do I really come into this state? Should be a query that should be answered instantaneously to the doctor. That's what the provenance gives. So this is what I really you know apply to a data point, whether it is a sensor or whether it is uh, some kind of uh, student uh, evolution uh, in the academic world. I just get to really answer all those questions instantaneously. That's what prominence really gives me. Well, yeah, I mean, and that's where you get to spend all your time after you deploy the platform because you don't have to worry about data security. Sure. <laughs> 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 so I, I, I'll show you how. So, yeah. so while Robbie's setting that up, to show you an actual demo, which is kind of rare to have a blockchain and actually show a demo versus just talk about I need money, um, which is something else that's very interesting and uh, look forward to you know what we can do together. So just for the people that I saw taking pictures and asking a couple of questions about the presentation, um, if you'll come give me your card after the fact so I can have your contact or if I know you, just let me know. Um, I can send you the presentation, be happy to do that. Um, there, obviously, there's a lot more information that goes into this presentation. This is very high level, um, just non-NDA type of a, of a presentation. So, um, Robbie's going to go ahead and set up the, the, the demo right now and show you. So, back to the Providence while he's setting that up. On the Providence side of things, um, supply chain is a really, really big issue right now. Uh, both in transportation and also in the medical field of knowing where the, the, the origin of either the fruit or the medication, where it came from, all the way to how do I find it on the shelf in case somebody comes and claims some form of either it being you know, out of an expiration date, it being out of temperature, out of spec, or it being something that's expired and now you've caused an Ebola or a wisteria outbreak as our beloved ice cream of choice happened uh, not long ago. But the thing that was interesting is how long it took for them to trace back to find out where that product originated from. So a lot of times now you start seeing all these batch numbers that are on, on the packaging as well as expiration dates so that they can start helping trace that back. Data Providence, literally we can go all the way to the farm of where the, the, the sheep are being farmed in order for them to be clipped to bring the wool into the factory, spun into a yarn, then sent over, made into a fabric, then sent over, made into a product, and then shipped out to the end customer. So we can see Providence all the way back to the farmer's level, and even beyond that if you wanted to. So Providence is a really, really big thing um, on the supply chain. So question? I was just gonna, I was just gonna say, you guys could go and back to the telephone network and get Providence or have originating phone numbers solved so that when I get a phone call, I know that the number <laughs> yeah. that's displayed is the one that's actually calling me. That would be a big one to solve. Yep. So um, <laughs> if, if you actually want to do a little, if you want to do a little research on that, Kalea actually was supposed to be the one on the government side to be able to help us do that. Um, so anyway, that's enough I say about that. So. See, uh, let, let me talk a little bit about the blockchains. I'm sure that a lot of people here are to really to, no, trying to understand how blockchain really maps to this world. The blockchain is all about integrity and trust. You know, because you know today you're talking about the bitcoins and the ethereums. It's all about your money. You're really you know going to these blockchains because you trust that your money is going to be secure out there. So when it really comes to the non-financial world, okay, I'll, I'll tell you how it really evolved with me. When I had a guy with whom I wanted to do a data address application, the first thing he said was, yes, I want to use Ethereum because it is the most glamorous term today. So mm -hmm. I want to use the Ethereum thing. Okay, Ethereum is good. I mean, if you want me to set up Ethereum, it will take me you know, a couple of hours. That's it, max. 
then the issues of you know you know paying the whole thing only with the ethereum currency came in no 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 i i want it to be you know a payment gateway where i can use my credit cards where a student can pay you know with his uh, whatever it is cash credit cards etc etc so he didn't want ethereum and then ethereum as is basically it's like a cloud it has got its own evm it has got its own storage cost so you got to pay for all that no he didn't want to pay for all that so when people really look at all these things you know all these things come into picture you got to pay for uh, the computing power the evm power you got to pay for the storage no they don't want to do all that so they want what they want is basically the functionality of the ethereum but it should be again integrated with the old world if you will so the solution for that is to really get the functionality in the data structures and the way ethereum behaves into a customized world and from there you know they and then they wanted you know they heard about all these uh, you know ransomware attacks the ddos attacks all these things are happening and they also don't want their data to be lying on somebody else's computer which is going to happen if you are going to get into a public chain like bitcoin or ethereum they know they don't want that they want some kind of a customized uh, you know or say distributed batch given to them okay now how are you going to you know really handle the uh, issue of the blockchains and ethereum is not able to consume media data you know it's all dealing with a single data called currency today it cannot really deal with your media it cannot deal with uh, i mean all sorts of uh, other pieces that you want to really put on your blockchain how do you handle that so all these things come to picture when people say that i want to really deal with ethereum and i want to be the latest and greatest guy but when it comes to customization you got to be able to really you know really dig into the innards of that and provide that functionality you want to i i call it as an integrity server and what i do is in an integrity server i have all the functionality of the ethereum for example written as an what is known as an ethereum hello paper which is the bible for ethereum i do all that as a ledger and everything and then i marry it with something like ipfs IPFS is a distributed file system which is becoming very popular and there are at least four or five of them in the public domain so i married with IPFS where in addition to getting protection of ddos and ransomware i will be able to put the data in an organized way like a graph database because you want to be able to do analysis you want to be able to really do the traversal to really find the innards of your data so i do all these things so i really marry uh, several concepts out here the ipfs of the world and then i superimpose the graph database on that and i use an ethereum ledger to really have your data and what i do is i just put some pointers into my IPF, ipfs on an ethereum ledger so the, the, those are the things that i really play with here there are very complex things and if you, somebody wants to really understand that it will take a couple of hours for you to really understand it if you're not uh, into the innards of these data structures and things like that but what i have done out here is for example this one is uh, an iot completely integrated into opc ua and uh, i mean let me let me start running it and show you what what it means so so this yeah this, i mean this i've done completely in node js this is my you know favorite language mainly because of the scalability issues here it with the the async address nature that it has got it has allowed me to really scale up to a billion sensors without very break a sweat uh, yeah so so what what it is showing out here is uh, the temperature and pressure sensors have some data that is coming out and what i have is an opc ua server that is wrapping up the sensors so once they really come out of the op opc ua server they are all completely encrypted and what what you see here here is an encrypted data that is coming out but what you see out there is verified it is really going through my this is this is bitcoin blockchain this is not ethereum but this is bitcoin blockchain it is getting verified with uh, a bitcoin blockchain parallelly and then the data is getting verified that which is telling you that it is not being subjected to any kind of man in the middle attack or it's getting it's not getting corrupted in this complex web of chain that is happening <laughs> and of course i have several screens where i can do the sharing and another stuff and this particular you know gentleman uh, hasn't been given an authority to really decrypt it 
So it, it won't get ever decrypted because the secure key distribution hasn't happened to this particular gentleman. But whereas, uh, you know, if I get into somebody else, so uh, since I've asked the monitoring of the data, you're, you're still getting the data out there. It's being monitored. So the idea, I mean, of course, it can be any paradigm out here. The, the paradigm that I have is now it is being monitored. Anybody can see it. But only those guys that have been uh, distributed the key with which has been uh, multi-signated and things like that, can see this. Yeah, so th yeah, this particular uh, person has been given the key in the complex web of uh, uh, graph that I have uh, where the secure key distribution other things happen and the certificate distribution happens. And this is how the secure key distribution is now allowing the decryption of all this data. So it is going through all those five pillars that I talked about and all the sensor data that is coming out uh, as uh, temperature and pressure or the million sensors that I've tested with so far. You know, you can, you can really deal with it using all the five pillars. And there is a blockchain out here that is really taking care of the integrated pillar as well. So <clears throat> I'm trying to imagine a use case for this one, right? So if, say for example, there is a sensor out there and it's giving both the temperature and the pressure. That data is hopping from A and then B and then C, right? And is does this, cap cap like say for example, I just want this situation where A can actually only see the temperature, but not the pressure. B can only see the pressure, but not the temperature. Absolutely. Whereas C can see all of them. Yes. So this is one of the only, I mean, so otherwise, how are you, I mean, this is, it seems like this is a pretty good use case for things of that nature, <coughs> exactly. where you only want to enable certain fields to be seen, because otherwise, once they have the raw feed, they have everything. Exactly. So essentially, I take care of that in two, in, in, in two places. I take care of that in the policy server. You can really, you know, whatever policy that you just sent out can be described in a policy server. It's very simple JSON that you can do and then do so it. You're able to apply policy at a field level. Yeah. I mean, you can do it at the policy level or you can also do it at the authentication level as well as you can also do it at the key distribution level. So if you don't want the key for that particular piece of data temperature to be given to Mr. B, you can prevent that at the key distribution level. You can, you can prevent that at the policy level. Or what I also do in the authentication is whatever data that you just spoke about, I encrypted it with multiple keys and I keep it encrypted and that's what I call as FHE. So I, I really check that right there and if you haven't really encrypted it with Mr. B's key, he's going to be kicked out right there in the first layer, which is the authentication. So you're encrypting data as it's in, in, in transit and then it's going to be encrypted with the same or protected in the same manner when it's at rest somewhere. Yeah. What are you typically doing? Are you typically transferring it through a step where it's unencrypted or are you using it all the way from, you know, could you go sensor to, to, to storage encrypted in at rest? Yeah. How are you doing it? You see, whatever you're saying, there are a yeah, lot of terminologies that come into picture and each one differs from, uh, you know, person's perspective. When you say it's being done in transit, transit, I consider everything as the transport security. Right. Which is basically your SSLs and TLS and things like that. Okay, but it's also encrypted over that same link on top it's, of the SSL. Yeah. With your bit blockchain technology, I'm just wondering whether it comes out of that blockchain encryption at some point before it gets stored in another form with another encryption uh, or... I, I, mean, do, I do all this description at the client. Because client is the only one that needs to see it decrypted. Well, what if the client is, is uh, asynchronous and so you need to store it somewhere, it has to be at rest for a while. What, what do you mean the client is asynchronous? Uh, I'm, I'm looking at it a half hour later. Yeah. So the data is encrypted at the sensor. Does it get stored in that same protected manner or does it maybe get processed out of encryption, then stored again in a different encryption? That's see, see guys, only when you want to see it at the client, it gets decrypted. Anywhere else in the database or in the server, it's always going to stay. Period. There's no, see, the thing is, the whole idea here is, you know, uh, I, I, mean, I forgot to put that slide. I start with the premise that you are already compromised. So I, I'm not going to trust anybody with the server. So when, when somebody gets in, I know that there is a bad guy already lurking right there in the server, so I will never ever decrypt it in the server. Okay. So I will never ever decrypt it in the, in the database, 
I'll never ever decrypt it in, in the transit. So in the end, that example you had on the medical, there would be a whole bunch of different pieces in that medical document, each one of which is the original record from that doctor. Yeah. So you just have an amalgam of different thing, pieces. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, so this, this is how I deal with an IoT where I always assume that I'm, I've been compromised. The guy has been there for ever. So the bad guy is really you know, intercepting my data everywhere. So the only person that I trust is the client because you get in into the client with all sorts of authentication and everything. And out there, again, I don't really depend <coughs> on anybody's authentication software. I do it myself. I make sure that the secure key has been distributed. I make sure that I really talk to the blockchains of the world to make sure that the data that is being presented to me so that I really don't get into the Stuxnet kind of situation. And I make sure that you know, yeah, see, one thing everybody needs to understand about blockchain is the ledger is holy. The ledger is always absolutely secure. All the breaches that are happening out here are happening in the periphery. The smart contracts are the ones that are the culprit. Now, there was a $21 million heist that happened recently uh, where, you know, all the smart contracts, they work on multi-signatures. The contract is like this. I own an asset. I own this asset, say, along with my wife and my, say, my family members. If I'm selling it to somebody, all these people need to sign off before it, before the ownership really passes to somebody else. Okay? Wonderful. Multi-signatures. But what happened with that $21 million heist that happened recently was the thief became the owner. That means he replaced all the signatures with his own signatures. So all the original signatures were gone. How did that happen? Yeah, if you are into programming, it is a very simple thing to understand. The guy who wrote the smart contract was dumb. He forgot to really make the signatures private. If you are into C++ and Java and things like that, all the member variables that you declare can be either private or protected and things like that. So he forgot to make all the signatures private. Period. One simple mistake. So, and this Ethereum thing has got, uh, I mean, it tries to be very smart. When you, when, you, when you do the programming, you always run into you know, core dumps, crashes, and things like that. So to prevent all that, what the smart contract guys did was, if I really execute a method on a smart contract that doesn't exist, they give you a safety net, you know, which says that this is the default thing that, that's going to get executed. Thereby, you don't crash the program. So what this guy did was, he kept on sending a method that didn't exist. So he got that safety net. And in the safety net, he gets all the privileges. And he overwrote the signatures with his own signatures. So he stole $21 million before they found it. And uh, you know what they did was, you know, they can't prevent it. So the, the Ethereum uh, you know, original guys, they wrote a script quickly to really take out uh, $39 million left out there. They just put it into something else. They cannot ever recover it. They cannot prevent it. So they had to be faster than him to really protect the $39 million that were left in those three accounts that he was uh, robbing. Same thing, $300 million got blocked last week. Why? Same thing, the guy who wrote the smart contract did not make it private. So the guy became the owner, and this guy, he just eliminated a single method in a contract. That method is the one that can distribute the money whenever our, that will allow people to withdraw the money. Period. So the whole thing is now blocked. That $300 million is now blocked. Nobody can touch it. It's dead. So it's all about, uh, you know, the guys who are writing these programs, writing very bad programs and not really looking at the simple things uh, that are supposed to be done to make it private, that, is, that are supposed to be done correctly, that is really making all these robberies and keys happen. So, so that's, yeah. A smart guy once observed that a computer can compound a human error a thousand times in a single second. <laughs> this, is, this is another example. We need providence of software engineers. <laughs> <laughs> Equifax was, was software. If they, if they only use for software, bad software. software. And hire the proper reviewers. There, oh, exists. reviewer? <laughs> I mean, get your review. I mean, that's yeah. what it actually does. It, you, you can actually put your signature on a piece of code. Too. Yeah, this, this, is, this is another data. This is another data at rest application that I'm doing for a client. Uh, so he basically wanted uh, the universities, uh, 23 private universities, 
and their uh, you know corresponding community colleges and everything to provide a student information system. Uh, you know, wherein the the grades and other things are going to be shared to the third parties in the, in the other universities that they are applying to, uh, in a trustable manner. Okay. Uh, so what I did here was my original application was done for real time. Uh, so this is where I really migrated to the next generation Ethereum and everything. So now this is being backed by you know, the Ethereum and things like that. What I, what I what I did was basically, you know, I can't give you the original data, but I just wanted to you know, give you some dummy data the way um, you know, I have done it. I really, you know, consumed all the data that is coming from 23 universities plus all the community colleges and everything. This is a normalizing database, which is a graph database that I use. So I normalize all this data that is coming from disparate sources. Somebody has, uh, you know, an RDBM is there, somebody has got, uh, you know, uh, CSV files, somebody has it in, uh, you know, Excel files, all kinds of stuff. So I normalize it. There are two ways to normalize this. One way, which is basically a property database, property graph database that I use. I also do it with a semantic database, a semantic graph database, which is much richer. But, uh, you know, graph, property graph databases have got a much better momentum with regard to the tools and everything. So I chose to do this uh, in a graph database called Orient DB which is extremely well done, very secure. They really do lots of things from scratch very well. So whenever the data comes into the database, it's automatically disk, disk encrypted and things like that. That would have prevented something like uh, Equifax happening. So a lot of things are done very well, and I normalize all this data. And what I actually do here is, this graph database is superimposed on IPFS. IPFS is interplanetary file system. That is a distributed web. I really superimpose all that, whereby I get the DDoS and ransomware productions very well done. And I really link it with an Ethereum ledger. An Ethereum ledger basically has no real data, it has got pointers or links pointing to my graph database. So I, I really do the integrity checks and other things in an Ethereum ledger, whereas the data is residing on an IPFS. The real data is residing on a database residing on an IPFS. <laughs> so that, that's how I, I, I do this stuff. So let, let, me, let me show you how this is done. For example, uh, you know, John Thomas and David Smith are the students that are applying to Stanford. And uh, they have uh, attended many schools before they did their bachelors, and they have all sorts of grades that are coming up. So uh, out here, David Smith has asked UT Arlington, to give access to Stanford to look at a particular grade. Whereas uh, he didn't want to share his Dallas County grades to this guy. So he can selectively go ahead and then do a secure key distribution. So what's happening out here is, when I suck up all the data from all these universities, once they are born into my system, whether it is hardware I mean, or software out there with my chip guiding it, I completely encrypt it with multi-signatures. That means out here, I'm just, for simplicity sake, I have two players that are owning that grade. UT Arlington and David Smith are jointly owning that grade. So that grade is going to be multi-signature encrypted with both the signatures. So if David Smith wants to release it, he cannot release it. He has to really tell UT Arlington because they need to make some money out of it. So he needs to really communicate with uh, UT Arlington. Everything is real time out there. And both UT Arlington and David Smith have really given access to Stanford for that particular grade to be released. This, in fact, I made it simple out here. In fact, David Smith has given Stanford all the access to all the grades. But Dallas County hasn't given Stanford to look at that particular grade because they didn't get their money. They didn't get their payment. So that, whatever encryption that you see out there, <coughs> Whatever stuff that you see out there, you know, is completely encrypted, multi-signature, and it is backed up by the private and public keys. I mean, in fact, it is backed up by the public keys of these guys. The secure key distribution is actually the private key that is being given to the players out there. The integrity column that you see out there is what is really going to the Ethereum stack, and then really checking it out there. I mean, it checks it, and then you know, the integrity is verified out there. You don't want and a, a, a hacker friend of David Smith go and change the grade to something else. So 
So all that stuff is all guaranteed on that Ethereum stack out there. So this is a data address application that is uh, you know really handy for any data. This is good for uh, you know any domain, a medical record or. Uh, or uh, a car uh, fax kind of application where uh, you know the car fax is supposedly telling you, you know, these are the uh, you know things that a car fax has been put in with over a period of time. Yeah. Oh, cool, cool. So I'm trying to understand how this data got created. Is it like, you know, there's always a time series event, right? Like you know, David first probably went to UT Arlington and did some courses, and then he went to Dallas County and did some courses. Yeah. So when Dallas County hit. In the end, it's a lot. You go, he, he goes to like A, B, C universities to do it. Now, in order to create this data, all, I'm assuming that all data needs to be at B. Like, B cannot just individually generate one line of data, right? It has to basically get the UT Arlington Statistics 101, and then it, it adds on the Economics 101 data on top of that, and then signs it, right? It's just like a glob of data that people are adding on. Is that, yeah, is, is that a first thing? They're independent, right? He has gone to UTI Arlington, maybe he doesn't go to Dallas County anymore. So it's a completely independent like, piece of data. I'm trying to understand like how the trail is getting formed. Like, okay, say David Smith first went to UTI Arlington, he got an A in statistics. UTI Arlington created a blob. Yes. He then went to Dallas County. Now, does this blob have to go to D Dallas County to get uh, data? Everything is federated. I mean, I, I can't make Dallas County and New York into top teachers. There's no way. I mean, yeah, what you're, what you're seeing is a, a link between UT Arlington and Dallas County. That should not happen. I mean, these guys are uh, so egoistic, they'll never talk. No way. I mean, you, you can't really depend so on that. So it's actually a central server then that they're yeah. basically talking to. Yeah, and exactly. the central server is like taking this taking this and then putting it in a bigger blog and signing it with both. Yeah, yeah, you can't make it peer to peer there. I mean, these guys are, uh, you know, All right, done. very boneheaded. They won't talk. So, yeah. right. okay. so uh, these are general questions So uh, that relate to uh, potential costs and network latency. So a lot of what you mentioned is using uh, Ethereum to uh, for some various other steps. So uh, question one is uh, it seems that you might need gas or ether to for some of this as well too. So does that impact the cost is uh, question one. Question two is you also, it seems that there's a lot of additional network transactions that seem to potentially be going on as well too to verify a lot of the network activity. So is that impacting network latency or bandwidth or something along those lines? So those are my two. Yeah, yeah. the first question I kind of answered already. When they didn't want to pay the gas and uh, you know, whatever ethers that really come up with that, they really wanted to have all the cake and eat it too. So they wanted to have all the functionality of Ethereum done separately from scratch. That's what I've done. If you want an Ethereum thing, it doesn't take more than two hours to really set up an Ethereum node and you can start operating. But the only thing that you can put out there is just the data about your money. But out here, they wanted to put the documents about, about the student, they wanted to put even the video about the student, all this stuff needs to come into that. Into that. Yes, Ethereum is trying to handle it. They got uh, new tools you know, like blockchain and media chain that they're putting together, but they didn't exist even six months before. So when I did all this, so I had to really comply to whatever Ethereum yellow paper really you know gives you as the set of rules that you need to follow, and I built everything from scratch. I forgot your second question. So additional, yeah, network latency and performance. Yeah, so the, the network latency is not an issue here. It's all, I mean, okay. The, the figure is, I, when I measure it, it is 13% latency that I get with, with all these encryptions and decryptions and things like that. So it's a 30% hit for you to be secure and to be trustworthy and everything. That is the kind of uh, hit that you get here. So, so what about that? Answer. So, you know, in that uh, scenario that was laid out in the beginning where you're all inter potentially all internal uh, network traffic is being routed through your system. So there's also uh, presumably a time latency See, see well, right from the days when I would say 20 years back when I did this, uh, uh, you know, what I call as perimeter security in the telecom world, what, what we used to do was we used to take one more hop into my blog and then do the scrubbing and everything out there and send it back to the consumer. So it, it, that one more hop is something that you'll have to endure if you want to get all this, you know, nice scrubbing and everything. And, and, and the good thing is like more people do it, they'll have hardware accelerated. 
yeah, see, like I said, today, uh, you know, I get 100x acceleration when I do it in hardware. It's a very difficult thing to do, so that's where I can mitigate a lot of that 30% can come down drastically. So instead of doing it in software at the application layer, but you do it in the hardware layer, you get much, much better speed software. Yeah, that, that's one thing, yeah. So th that's, th that's how a data in uh, transit application really comes up, really complying to all the five pillars of cryptology here. And uh, yes, I mean, even that might get defeated, uh, you know, I don't know, I mean, uh, we will have to find out. But you're really close, I mean, if you look at all the celebrated uh, breaches that have happened, I feel that we have really closed a lot of, I mean, practically every door that we can talk about out there. The ransomwares and the DDoSes and, uh, you know, the insider threats where, you know, once I really get the data bond into my system, I do multi-signatures. So there's not going to be an adverse node with the highest, you know, credentials given to him in a company, taking his own unilateral decisions, all these things have been covered, the insider threats have been covered, uh, the DDoS, the ransomware, and of course, you get the confidentiality with uh, both AES encryption and the PK encryption that I do. So, I, I think I have a pretty solid case of saying that I have all the doors taken care of. That doesn't mean that I'm 100% guaranteeing anything, nobody can guarantee that. But you get a very, very holistic point of view. When I really talk to a lot of authentication companies and things like that, they swear by their authentication. And you know, Kurt has introduced me to some guys who are investing only in authentication companies today, which is, uh, I would say, a 20, 25 year old concept that has been defeated repeatedly. That's the whole reason the perimeter security companies, the CASB companies, they don't do the whole HR. Like, uh, you should have heard about this term called CASB, which is uh, access broker, whatever it is called. I mean, it's a security broker uh, where they stand as a sentry outside and they look at the traffic that is coming into your node. So whenever you get into a login in the internet, they say, oh, no, we don't know. We are, you are logging in from, from France. That's something that you have not, never done before. So you got to you know, somehow have some kind of an OTP or something to you to authenticate yourself. This is what is being done by the CASBs of the world today. OK. And those guys, once they determine that you are the person, and if you can authenticate uh, out there, that's it. You have got a free access. They have to work with all sorts of uh, companies like Symantec to encrypt it and things like that. They don't have a complete edge ladder put together. Because they are not looking at the security from this holistic perspective of five pillars. That's what is missing big time out there. And I've done that for both real-time applications with at least two pro I mean, a pops up protocol of OPC UA and uh, there's something called uh, OMG DDS which is a bus. And this that I've shown you today is a web of client server applications, a galactic web of you know, web, I mean applications that you can do that can handle very fast, very low latency real-time applications, as well as uh, this data in address applications like education, medical, or uh, the automotive data. I mean, there are a myriad of applications that I've dealt with so far. Uh, I mean, I can discuss uh, a couple of hours uh, about those things, but I'm sure that we have uh, positive time here. This is how I, I handle the security holistically. <laughs>